Hi, good afternoon. My pleasure to present BioLife Solutions. We're a public life science tools company based near Seattle in Bothell, Washington. Please note our safe harbor statement. Before I make some introductory comments, just to call out my colleagues, I have Dr. A.B. Matthew, our CTO here in the front row. He hates it when I do that, but everybody knows A.B. If you don't, this is what he looks like. And Daphne Taylor, our CFO, is over here. So earlier this year, BioLife completed a $15 million equity raise. Uh, registered direct offering. Concurrent with that, we had $14 million in debt that converted to equity, so we've cleaned up the balance sheet and really positioned us for growth. We are a best-in-class tools provider, and specifically with clinical-grade biopreservation media solutions, and I'll talk about the product portfolio in just a minute. We're selling into three key markets. Two are stable with some growth, Regen Med, which is clearly a sweet spot for us, and it's great to see many, many customers here at the conference holds potential growth for BioLife and really just great breakout potential over the next few years. We ended June with $12 million in cash and no debt. By way of introduction, we're clearly in the, the biopreservation space with tools that can help our customers extend shelf life stability and improve yield, uh, both of which can be monetized and that's completely relevant to the regen med space and cell therapy manufacturing and commercialization. So for many of you here at the conference, you know the products Hypothermosol and Cryostore. These solutions are used to store, ship, freeze, and administer cells and tissues to patients in clinical applications. Very recently, we decided to enter the cold chain management space. So I'm going to speak about a new joint venture that we've branded Biologistics CCM. And this involves precision, smart, controlled temperature containers for cells and tissues and cloud-based biologistics management. So let's talk about just Regen Med here. For us, we view two key opportunities to help our customers, again, extend yield and improve viability and survival. And the first starts at the, the far left with the acquisition of source material from a patient, be it an autologous or an allogeneic application. We're acquiring some source material that needs to move across time and space to some processing facility. So it needs to be bathed in an appropriate preservation media and transported in a, a functional, robust container. Once at the factory, uh, our customers do their magic. The final manufactured dose is produced. And again, this now needs to get back to the clinic, again, in an appropriate container and bathed in the appropriate optimized preservation media. And we really want to encourage folks to think about the final product, not just as the biologic, but the combination of the biologic, the media, the primary packaging, any secondary packaging, the shipping container it's in, and the mode of transportation and temperature. All these things together affect final outcome and therapeutic efficacy. So the products that A.B. and his colleagues really invented due to some discoveries they made on the, the molecular basis of preservation-induced cell death were uh, really quite phenomenal. Uh, the outcome for our customers is to, again, improve yield. If we can save more cells, we can reduce variable cost. Uh, if we can improve viability and survival uh, and extend stability and the transportation clinical delivery footprint, we can reduce manufacturing capex costs for our customers. Hyperthermosol is tuned for two to eight C storage of cells and tissues. The product is optimized for low temperature biology to decrease free radical accumulation and really to better balance the intracellular state at low temperature. Again, it's all about survival and extending stability. On the companion side, so CryoStore is the companion cryopreservation preservation freeze media product. It's packaged in user-friendly uh, packaging options, as you can see. And CryoStore is a very similar formulary-wise to hypothermosol and includes additives which mitigate, again, these molecular cell stress pathways that I mentioned, not only during freezing, but even less importantly during the, the very critical thaw phase, which is very injurious to cells and tissues as well. This is just but one of uh, many, many evidence and proof sources we have on our website. These are human MSCs derived from bone marrow that we stored at 2 to 8 C for five days in a traditional homebrew media on the left and in hypothermosol on the right. After five days in the cold, the cells were returned to normal thermic conditions at 37 degrees C and allowed to recover for a day. So at 24 hours, these were assayed for the green cytoskeleton, the red mitochondria, and the blue Hirsch nuclear stain, and you can clearly see what's going on here. So this is just but one of many assays our customers use to, to see with their own eyes compared to a, a homebrew or another competitive or commercial pre-formulated product uh, what sort of preservation efficacy uh, they can see. This slide really tends to illustrate uh, the, the very real impact on biologic stability on COGS, both on the, the fixed and the variable side. So it's common sense, but we know that if we can improve the, the yield of source material, less is required to make a manufactured dose, or the corollary is we can make more doses from the given amount of source material. And finally, on the manufactured cell side, if we can improve yield, uh, we can have the same uh, desired therapeutic effect with less cells so the variable cost can be reduced. 
The combination of both can be enabled through the use of cryostore or hypothermosol throughout the workflow continuum, starting with the acquisition of source material through the final delivery of the product to the patient. This is really a kind of a bad news slide, but through the use of non-optimized or non-engineered preservation media, uh, many customers have seen or faced potential clinical distribution limitations. If a product must be infused within 12 or 24 hours, can you really get it around the world? <coughs> Excuse me. Or are you limiting your clinical delivery footprint? Do you need to go and raise a bunch of money to, uh, to build manufacturing facilities on every continent, right? Uh, we've seen now with uh, hypothermosol in particular for stability of the final manufactured dose, the ability to extend several day preservation, meeting critical release criteria for patients, and in many cases reducing this COGS uh, example that we're talking about. So I mentioned biologistics. Uh, it made perfect sense to us to think about what are some other tools that we can add to the portfolio to, again, help our customers really optimize yield uh, and reduce cost. And we pay, became very aware of the current paradigm with shipping cells and tissues around, which for the most part are in styrofoam coolers or in vacuum panel devices. And in most cases without embedded electronics or intelligence. The spend and market spend for products and services, cold chain shipping devices, related temperature controlled, uh, trackers and instruments is quite significant. It's perhaps a $3 billion market last year and growing nicely over the next several years. This shipper that you see on the left of this slide is the Evo. This is the smart shipper. We're going to be marketing through biologistics. This is an amorphous silica nanoporous aerogel insulating material that is, lends itself to be thermoformed and we can make very nice looking products from this. Evo has a cell phone built into the base. It's embedded. It has a thermocouple that's measuring the payload temperature. <clears throat> Pardon me, a light sensor measuring when the lid is open so we can give customers some chain of custody, um, protection and comfort. It's designed for reuse, so we're going to make it very easy through a web-based portal for customers to initiate a shipment, be able to track, logging into the portal, where is the, the device, what's the temperature of the payload, has it been exposed to an excursion, yes, no, helping our customers make these clinical delivery or infusion decisions or not. Now they'll know. The current paradigm, for the most part, is relegated to relying on an out for delivery message or on the, on the truck message in terms of where their package is. Customers will be able to set temperature excursion alarms and alerts and also geofence alerts. If a customer knows that it takes about 30 minutes for the package to go from the airport to the clinic and that's about the same time to prep the patient, now with email alerts that our customers can set up, you will be able to enhance the, the stakeholder experience throughout the delivery chain and really improve the overall biologistics. So biologistics again is a joint venture that we just announced with Savsu Technologies. That's the supplier of the shipping container. Uh, we're going to make some significant investments to launch the product in the portal. We have the exclusive worldwide marketing distribution rights to the product and the service. Again, Savsu is the, the shipping supplier. We're going to manage the JV uh, operations out of our facility in Bothell, Washington. And the operating expenses that we incur from running the JV will be, will be reimbursed to BioLife by the joint venture. And uh, getting to the bottom here, uh, so the excess cash generated by the joint venture will be uh, split between BioLife and Savsu based on our respective uh, ownership. And this is a 20-year agreement. Currently in the sort of the beta program uh, phase right now, so if you're interested to learn more about biologistics and the Evo Shipper, you might want to consider joining the beta program. I'd encourage you to talk to Daphne here, AB, or even Brian Hawkins, a new team member here, is in the front row as well. So uh, interested to, to help uh, you learn some things and us learn some lessons during the beta program leading up to the formal launch. So we're certainly coming right to the Regen Med space and our current customers as some initial uh, prospects to do this. But we certainly want to market to the broader markets as well and, again, move back to biobanking and target pharma and vaccine companies. Much like we've done over the last several years, uh, for the most part on the backs of AB through his uh, scientific expertise and really establishing a, a credibility perspective and expertise in biopreservation within regenerative medicine related to our liquid preservation media products, that's clearly what we're going to do here and the science has to sell itself. We understand that, but we certainly want to be known as a leader in, in biopreservation and biologistics and we think biologistics will help us do that. One last piece of the business to talk about. So we do run a, a very opportunistic but niche contract manufacturing uh, business where we're doing um, aseptic media formulation fill and finish for a small number of customers that are not competitive to our own offerings. Uh, you might say we overbuilt our production capacity over the last few years. That's fine. We're ready for Regen Med to take off when that happens uh, over the next few years. In the meantime, what can we do? So we have expertise, again, in, in GMP, very high quality aseptic formulation fill and finish, uh, and doing a, a reasonable amount of business in that at, at decent margins. 
Last year, half the revenue came from one contract manufacturing customer. <clears throat> Pardon me, that customer moved away from us in March, but in July of this year, we announced a new long-term agreement with a floor-based company called Somolution, where for Somolution, we're going to manufacture Duragraft. And Duragraft is a new saphenous vein storage solution, uh, again, for cabbage and other vascular access surgeries. And so we're deep in the whole process engineering and validation uh, phase with Somolution. If you have solutions you might want to consider having us quote or, or discuss, again, see A.B. Brian, Daphne, and myself. We'd be glad to talk to you about that. Drilling down a little bit more into the three key markets that we're serving. So on the traditional side, biobanking and drug discovery, you all know what those are. These are reasonable and stable growing in terms of end market spend. We have several customers and reliable income and ordering patterns from the customers. On the emerging side, it's really all about cell therapy, tissue engineering, regenerative medicine uh, with explosive potential growth. Our products are now embedded in over 130 customer clinical trials. Again, so hypothermosol and cryostore are baked into the manufacturing process of over 130 clinical trials evaluating novel cell and tissue products and therapies. In many cases, as an excipient reagent, the remainder would be an ancillary application where it's washed, and in just about any route of administration you can imagine. The overall spend for preservation media is quite nice and attractive to us and could reach nearly a billion dollars over the next few years. Most of the growth expected to be driven by growth in the regenerative medicine market as more and more products become approved. Biobanking, as you may know, is comprised of umbilical cord blood banks, stem cell banks, tissue banks, bar repositories, and we've built a nice franchise selling hyperthermosol to hair transplant physicians who use uh, the product to store both the, uh, the extracted graft and also the grafts as they're uh, dissected up and then reimplanted into the scalp. The total spend for preservation tools and technologies uh, globally for all markets could reach $4 billion. Again, our addressable slice is for preservation media products and cold chain management solutions. Within drug discovery, we're selling to pharmaceutical companies directly uh, and to most of the cell suppliers in the world who, again, are shipping to their customers living cells used in high-throughput screening Admetox uh, applications. The spend there is reasonable as well. Again, a stable market with reasonable growth. Again, within regenerative medicine, this is your space. This is who you are. Commercial cell therapy, tissue engineering companies, hospital-based labs, so on and so forth. The slide illustrates just a subset of customers who have allowed us to disclose their use and logos, and you can see many, many clinical indications, and these are large patient populations, big disease states with incidence and prevalence numbers that are, are pretty remarkable. And in many cases, you'll see our products used by more than one customer targeting the same clinical indication. And again, in, in most cases, uh, excipient, so not washed, so the products are used both as a preservative and also the vehicle or carrier solution. How these 130 clinical trials break down is along the bottom, so you can see at the far or the lower right, 13 are in phase three, 60 in phase two, and so on and so forth. We estimate here, based on uh, some internal modeling and customer disclosures in that, that the, the potential annual revenue per clinical indication, if the customer gets approval and commences large-scale manufacturing, could be between $500,000 and $2 million per year in annual revenue for BioLife. And again, with 130 shots on goal, this is a really nice franchise we built. Many of these trials will not meet their primary endpoints, or the customers will run out of money, we know. And we have to, have to handicap that quite well. But nevertheless, uh, this is a, a real reason to be thinking of BioLife as a, a very valuable tool supplier to the space. As a subset of Regen Med, uh, following uh, cell-based cancer immunotherapy, many, many customers have adopted the products, and the ones who I can't disclose, you might just think about them on the right side of the, of the slide here. Okay. So the global Regen Medicine market for all products and therapies end market spend. If you believe this report, and these come out you know, every three months or so, this tends to be a little bit more bullish, but this could be a $20 billion plus enterprise uh, worldwide spend. as. as regenerative medicine products start to, to shift the spend and, and cannibalize the spend for drugs and devices over the next few years. The investment thesis, just to recap, very well positioned for growth. We have over 500 customers, again, quite nicely situated within drug discovery and biobanking, and, and very well situated here in this market of regenerative medicine, again, with many, many clinical trials and customers pursuing indications where our products, again, are baked into the manufacturing process. We're very excited about biologistics and think that uh, the notion of using very robust, smart, enabled uh, shippers that do a much better job to maintain temperature uh, with, with cloud-based logistics and having our customers be able to track and assess where their package is and what the payload condition is will really raise the bar from a quality perspective. 
Production capacity in Bothell uh, for our own core proprietary products with current facilities and people, $100 million. We're not even close to that, so we have many opportunities, hence the reason for uh, starting this niche CMO of business that I mentioned a little bit ago. Since the March equity raise, we've got a fair amount of stuff done, so we terminated the slow margin contract in March, and then again in July we announced the, the, the Sun Lucian deal. We were granted a new patent for materials and methods used for hypothermic collection of whole blood. I spoke about Regen Med product adoption. Frost and Sullivan recognized the company with a Technology Innovation Leadership Award for the biopreservation media category, and again we formed the joint venture biologistics CCM uh, with SAVSU. Some investment fundamentals here. So we ended June with uh, about 12 million in cash, no debt, 13 million in shareholder equity. There are about 12 million shares out and 20 million fully diluted with options and warrants. The average share price hovering 250 or so. Uh, it's been a little pounded like many stocks of late, but we know if we execute, we'll be rewarded for that good performance. The average daily trading volume, it's a little south of 100,000 shares, but nevertheless, uh, we're a bit of an undiscovered story. The market cap floats between 25 and $35 million, and a little more than half the shares are in public hands right now. Things to look for and some drivers. Uh, well, I'm up here to say that I believe the stock is undervalued. There's a fair amount of volatility, uh, volatility due to low liquidity, uh, and we are a gem that I think uh, needs to be recognized, and, and you know, we'll, we will work hard to do that and let our performance speak for itself. The share price does uh, include a dollar per share of cash. And we think compared to some comps in the space uh, and some other tools companies uh, that were undervalued. And I really think the stock price today doesn't reflect what we're up to and, and the future value of the regenerative medicine franchise, which I mentioned earlier. Some catalysts and things to watch for. Again, continued adoption of the core products and really a tremendous upside in regen med. It'll be just really good news to, uh, to be able to announce that uh, the first few BioLife customers have uh, receive BLA approval and they can get busy and start to manufacture, you know, reasonable numbers of clinical doses every year. Look for the launch, the more formal launch of biologistics CC, uh, CCM in the next few months. Uh, and we'll start to talk about adoption metrics and we're going to consolidate the financials of the joint venture on our own financial statements so you'll get a chance to see what that means and how that's affecting our overall financial performance. And again, uh, as it becomes more meaningful, you know, we'll split out contract manufacturing revenue so you can see that as well. Thanks for your time. I think I went over by three minutes, so thank you very much.